it is quite useful to know a little bit about the bulk compositions of CI chondrites, as quite a few things can be learned from this. Here the CI composition of CI chondrites is shown. On the x-axis there is the atomic number, and these correspond to elements which are shown a plot itself, so these can be more easily found. On the y-axis there is the element composition of the chondrites normalized to magnesium, so what is, what is displayed on the y-axis is a mass ratio, and the scaling is logarithmic. It is then also quite helpful to know that CI composition is also often referred to as the solar composition. And this is of course not really true as the Sun has much more hydrogen, helium or also carbon or nitrogen, but still this is what is often found. You can already see here that hydrogen is of course not as abundant as in the Sun. A second observation is that there is quite a lot of wiggle. Now this wiggle is because the elements with even atomic numbers are more easily produced in nucleosynthesis than those with uneven numbers. Still, mostly when you look at bulk chondrite or meteorite element patterns, there is no wiggle. And the reason for this is that usually patterns are normalized to CI chondrites. If you look, for example, at another meteorite, now here this is the plot I just showed, and if you look at, for example, at CV chondrites, we see exactly the same wiggle, because this again is only normalized to magnesium, nothing else. And in effect, if I plot the CI chondrites and the CV chondrites, um, you can't really spot a difference between these two patterns here. But if I then divide CV chondrites by CI chondrites, the wiggle basically disappears and fractionation, so the difference between these meteorites, becomes much more obvious. And this is one of the reasons um, element concentrations are usually normalized by CI chondrites, which means they are divided by the concentrations of the CI chondrites. So this explains the wiggles. Well, the wiggles are explained by nucleosynthesis, but the normalization explains how we get rid of these wiggles in a plot. But this is not of importance here. Important here is what can we see in the CI chondrites, uh, the iconic compositions, what should we remember and what can we learn from this. Now let's first look at the major elements, the main elements, and why they are called main elements. Now these main elements are magnesium, silicon, and iron, and also, as you can see, sulfur. These all have about the same composition, and this is why these are called main elements. Sulfur is um, quite a little bit below because it's a logarithmic sc scaling, so the main elements are magnesium, silicon, iron, then sulfur. Then, of course, oxygen is also quite abundant. It is often not mentioned, but it is present in all the rocks and all the, uh, the silicate phases. And it's quite the most abundant element, as you can see here. So if you want to know what are the about 10 most abundant elements in the solar system, you can say, well, there's oxygen, then there's magnesium, silicon, and iron, but also sulfur. So then we already have, in total, five elements. And magnesium, silk, and iron are, of course, found in, for example, primitive meteorites in all the silicates, like olivine, pyroxene, the iron then in the metal, and um, also other minerals, but these then also have other elements. Now, if you go down about one order of magnitude, and, and then you'll check what we find here, what is, um, the next um, most abundant elements, and this is then aluminum, calcium, and nickel. So this is what we could write here, aluminum, calcium, and nickel. So we have another three elements. We already have eight elements here. And of course nickel is very often found together with iron. Now an order of magnitude below means that the metal should on average have a composition of 90% iron, 10% nickel, and this is what we find. So this is why these element abundances are quite helpful, because they remind us of, in a sometimes more easier way, the composition of the various components. Now aluminum and calcium, they occur in first a different component. These are the calcium-aluminum rich inclusions, of course. And it explains why they are so rare. The CAIs have abundances between maybe 0 and 3 to 4 volume percent, and one of the reasons for these rare abundances is because calcium and aluminum are an order of magnitude rarer than the other main elements. 
Um, and then, of course, they also occur in the clinopyroxene and in feldspar. If we then go a little more below, then we find something like um, sodium, chromium, manganese, uh, even more below is then titanium, and so on. So next we could write down here is maybe something like sodium, chromium, manganese, and then, well, it becomes even more red. So these are three, three more. And then we have a total of about 11 elements, and these we can remember, and we should remember, because from these and the relative abundances, from these we can deduce what, is, um, what are the abundant minerals. For example, with the sodium here, this is of course also in, mainly in feldspar. One last interesting observation is the rare earth elements here, which are the lanthanides. And um, one question might be, how many orders of magnitude are they below the main elements? And then we can simply count one, two, three, four, five, six. They are about six orders of magnitude below the main elements. And this is one reason why um, six orders of magnitude, so 10 to minus six. This is one of the reasons why the rare earth elements are given in ppm, in parts per million, because this is their relative concentration to the main elements. So again, this is something we can immediately see from the bulk composition of CI chondrites. And these are quite a number of reasons why um, knowing about the CI composition is quite helpful to understand the composition of the meteorites and also the abundances of the various components within the meteorites. And the 10 or 11 major elements we should remember are those written above here and also their about relative abundances.